I want to welcome you this morning to Trinity Reformed Baptist Church. This is our uh, recorded Bible study, and we will be continuing uh, our study in Romans chapter 12. We're moving into the first portion of Romans 13, and so this is really our kind of introduction to get into Romans 13. Before we begin this morning, I would like to open us up with prayer, and then we'll read Scripture. Heavenly Father, we praise you, Lord, for you give us opportunity and time to read your word and to hear it taught to us. We ask your mercy upon the teacher this morning, and we ask your mercy upon the hearer. Lord, will you give us clear minds, the teacher to explain and tell us of your truth and the hearer that by the power of the Spirit the word would be illumined to their minds and connected to their souls that they would hear these things and act upon them according to your word. We praise you, Lord, for who you are. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, I'm Brandon Smith, pastor at Trinity Reformed Baptist Church, and we're thankful for this Bible study time this morning. I want to begin by reading Romans 12, 1 through 8, and we'll begin looking at that together. <clears throat> Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. If service, in his serving. Or he who teaches, in his teaching. Or he who exhorts, in his exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Well, this morning, of course, I'm going to focus on verses 3 through 8, and I want to remind us that previously we considered the first idea of Romans 12. Now, we're using uh, Stuart Alliott's uh, condensation of some of these these points. Uh, he's got three main points in his commentary, and I'm using two of the three uh, verbatim, and the second one, which we'll do this morning, I've, uh, I've worked with the wording just a little bit to fit what I thought was best. Now, under those headings, though, last week our heading was, Paul explains the will of God for believers in consecration. Now that was Aliyah's heading, and then I began to unfold, uh, began to unfold that last week, based on other study and reading and work and so forth. I'll do the same this morning. I will use this heading, which is predominantly Aliyah's. Uh, Paul explains the will of God for believers in assembly assistance. Paul explains the will of God for believers in assembly. Assistance. Now, 
as we look at that, I'm going to unfold that uh, by, you know, looking at the text itself and dealing with some of the ideas from some of the commentators. And we'll work through some of this because our goal is to see this uh, as a whole, A, in the book of Romans, B, to see this in, in the context of God dealing with believers and how believers are to live and act. Firstly, he's told us that they're to be consecrated to God. They're to live as a holy sacrifice. Now he's going to say that that consecration to God has a specific function in mind, and that function is inside the assembly of believers. And it's going to be about service. This is why we're saying Paul explains the will of God for believers in assembly assistance. Once again, we're dealing with God's will for believers. God's will is not just making that choice or this choice. Should I eat Burger King today versus McDonald's? Which one uh, should I choose? Or who should I choose as my wife or my husband? Or, or those? Yes, those can be choices that are important. And we want to look at God's will. But God's will is summed up in some pretty specific ideas about how we ought to make choices like that. And one of the choices that we ought to make is God's will for believers is to be a part of the body of Christ. Note, Paul begins this section with consecrating ourselves to God, but not as individuals, but as those who are members one with another in the body of Christ. Therefore, the first concern for the believer is to learn how to join and function inside a local church. This is very important as we're looking at this. Paul is going to outline his thinking for the believer in seeing God's will, and he's going to outline it first and foremost in the context of the body of Christ. And that's even worked out in, in local bodies or local churches. Now we're going to have two uh, subheadings this morning. Firstly, the mercy of God is so great in salvation that our minds are employed in spiritual humiliation. The mercy of God is so great in salvation that our minds are employed in spiritual humiliation. Now, we have to understand, uh, it once again, you know, thinking from, from what we were discussing last week, it takes both body and mind in present time to work out our salvation with fear and trembling instead of complacency and haughtiness. Yes, we may approach God's throne boldly, but not in high estimation of our worthiness in personal self-righteousness. We approach the throne boldly based on the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. Therefore, we should not think too highly of ourselves, period, and we should not think too highly of ourselves in the context of the local church. Now, if we're going to employ our minds in spiritual humiliation, what does that mean in the context of who we are as believers? Well, firstly, believers are humbled in how we think of ourselves. Believers are humbled in how we think of ourselves. If we're not going to think too highly of ourselves, in what context uh, are we brought to such a place to, uh, to understand we're, we're being consecrated in humiliation? Well, remember that doctrine matters. We did a huge flyover. I mean, 35,000 foot flyover of the first 11 chapter, chapters of Romans. And Paul in those first 11 chapters is establishing these great doctrines of the Christian faith. The doctrine of sin, the doctrine of God's wrath, the doctrine of the law, uh, the doctrine of justification by faith alone, in Christ alone, uh, the work of the Spirit, the, the idea of remaining flesh and 
and the fumbling of the, of the believer in the Christian life, that we're going we're gonna to make mistakes and we're going to fall and we're going to fail. All these great doctrines of the Spirit working in us and sanctification, uh, giving us a, a, an eternal perspective of the doctrine of predestination. And, and that very doctrine alone, uh, predestination and election, that ought to humble us. And so believers are humbled in how we think of ourselves, we recognize our need for God's grace and salvation. Paul established that in the first 11 chapters. We really need God to deal with us as sinners. We are in need of His grace. And this is humbling. We cannot save ourselves. There's not one of us who is good, not one of us who is right before God, not one of us who seeks after God in the sense of true righteousness. This is very humbling that God elected many before the beginning of time to salvation through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why did He choose any of us? He chose us in His grace. There's not a why for us in the sense of of, of what did we do? Are we worthy? What was worthy enough about us? There was nothing worthy about us. We were chosen by grace alone. And this is what God did. This is humbling. When we think of ourselves inside the context of the church, we ought to think of ourselves in the context of being God's chosen people. That God, by His grace, saved us even though we didn't deserve it. That ought to be humbling. It ought to be humbling in how we interact with one another. Not only are we humbled in how we think of ourselves because we recognize our need for God's grace and salvation, but we recognize our need for God's grace and sanctification. So we're going to deal with salvation. Sanctification. And we're also going to deal with service. If we're going to really have an understanding of being humbled, we recognize our need for God's grace even in sanctification. Yes, we have work to do in sanctification. Sanctification is, is, is synergistic in that sense that's God working in us and man working according to God's work in us. And yes, we're doing something. But we, are, we recognize we are still in need of God's grace, even in sanctification. This is a humbling thought. We're not just saved and then all of a sudden it's like, woo! All right, we've, we've got it done. No, uh, we're not perfect then. We're, uh, we are continuing in a process uh, that's being made or that's working towards completion in, in being one day glorified. But we're not there yet. And since we're, we're not there, there, there's a sense in which we need to understand that we still need God working in us, His grace and sanctification. This is humbling. This is very humbling. And the third thing is we recognize our need for God's grace in service. In service. And this is really Paul's main emphasis here in Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. We need to recognize our need for God's grace in service. Uh, when we think rightly regarding service to the church, we think about it's God who allotted gifts to us as individuals. Now, the emphasis is, it, here is not for us to use those gifts just merely in an individual sense. We're using those gifts inside the body. God saved us by His grace. Therefore, He gifted us by His grace according to a measure of faith to each one of us. There's a, a measure given to us. Now, we're going to explain that a little bit more here in just a few minutes. But we have to understand that this is... Uh, how we are humbled when we think of ourselves, even in service, that we understand these gifts are from God. 
Whatever gifts we have, they are from God, and they need to be used in the right sense. We need to think soberly about ourselves and those gifts, negatively and positively. Now, as we go on to explain some of that in a minute, I want to deal with, with one thought first and foremost here. Paul, in, in a sense, is first uh, kind of throwing at us something that he's already, uh, he had really had to deal with with the Corinthian church. Paul is addressing this similar concern with the Corinthian church, um, or that he had had with the Corinthian church, and that people were fighting in the Corinthian church over particular gifts. Those gifts were recognized as more prominent and, in some sense, more worthy of honor. And in thinking this way, they put themselves and their desired gifts above each other and were thinking and were not thinking soberly about themselves or the gifts. But Paul called them to sober-mindedness by telling them that love was the greatest gift. And here he does something similar to that in Romans in verses 9 and 10. He says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Now, if you, if you understand what Paul said to the Corinthians, he said the greatest of all the gifts is love. And he's saying the same thing to the church in Rome. Before we get all worked up about what we're supposed to do, let's first of all know that we're supposed to love one another and the greatest of that, these gifts is the gift of love. This is what we have inside the body of Christ. So he's drawing them to this place to understand you need to think sober thoughts about yourself and the gifts that God gave you. Now, he says to do that because each has been allotted a measure of faith in this giftedness. And that's a, another uh, thought that we want to explore in just a moment, is what is the measure of faith uh, in verse 3? And he kind of really extends that even in verse 6 when he talks about according to the proportion of his faith uh, in, in some of the giftedness and, and prophecy uh, and teaching and serving and so on. What is the measure of faith? Now, Paul here in dealing with service and a measure of faith is not dealing with justification by faith per se or gospel faith, uh, believing. Um, now, that can be a portion of it in the sense that what we're talking about here is derived from those things. Uh, because we have believed uh, by God's grace, we've believed, we've been given faith as a gift, we've been justified by faith alone, because of that, we're going to have an outpouring of, of desire to live for God, to consecrate ourselves to Him, and to use our giftedness for Him. But we want to make some proper distinctions to aid our interpretation here. John Murray wrote of the juxtaposition between Christ himself and the members of his body. Um, he gave us this idea, and I think it's important. In Scripture, how is, is Christ described? He's full of grace and truth. In him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And Murray says, there is no measure to Christ's endowments. So, Christ doesn't have any measure of those things. He just is those things in fullness. Yet, believers do not possess these gifts in the same way Christ does. But each one of us has a measure of giftedness allotted to them by God. It's allotted uh, to them. Yes, they exercise their gift in faith, but in faith to Christ. This is the idea of, of the measure of faith is, first of all, the idea of, of understanding this is about faithfulness to Christ. Uh, we, we're looking to be, uh, the, the measure of faith here is being faithful to Christ. I'm going to, 
uh, exercise this gift in, gift in faithfulness to Christ. That is to say, we live to serve in faith to Christ, not to serve in glorification of ourselves. Our gifts are to be exercised in a measure of faith. Faith to Christ, not to ourselves. When we talk about this measure of faith, we're talking about to or in Christ. Uh, you know, anytime we exercise our gifts, we're not going to avoid the remaining flesh, and pride is always a part of remaining flesh. It's always going to be there. Uh, even sometimes we act uh, more humble, and, and that's even a part of, of our pride acting as though we want to we don't want to seem as though we're as, as, as understanding and thoughtful of our gifts as we, as we might be. We're not going to avoid, uh, in some sense, uh, the remaining flesh being uh, put forward sometimes in our giftedness. Yet, we have to remember that we're not really here to serve and glorify ourselves. We're to use our giftedness to glorify God and specifically in and through Christ. Now, another part of this interpretation of, of uh, the whole idea of, of a measure of faith and the giftedness, giftedness itself that's being brought out here in Romans 3, 4, and 5 particularly is going to be uh, looking at four questions. Number one, do we serve soberly understanding ourselves? When Paul says not to think too highly of yourself, you have to recognize that you and I, we may have giftedness, but we may not be as gifted as someone else. It doesn't mean my gift can't be used. It just means it may not be used in the same uh, place or in the same way as somebody else. It also means that sometimes we, would rec we need to recognize there's some gifts we just don't have. Uh, in, in the sense of, of that's not just the prevalent gift that we have in our life. Now sometimes, you know, we can say, well, you know, I don't have the gift of service, um, so I, I just won't be a servant. Well, no, the scripture doesn't get us away from that idea. We still need to be servant-minded with each other. Otherwise, you're not thinking uh, well of your brother and sister, and you're putting yourself ahead of them. And if you can't be kind and, and at some point uh, you know, step back from those things, you're just being arrogant. Well, there's a sense in which we have to understand here that th this is about sober thinking. Some gifts I just don't have. Some gifts I just don't have. Secondly, do we serve soberly, understanding we are one with each other in the body? Um, Paul says, for just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. We're, we're serving inside of a body here. Are we sober about that? Are we just being very individually minded? This is what I want to do, so I'm going to do it. And many people approach the church that way. And that's not really what it's about. It's about serving the whole of the body of Christ. Do we, thirdly, do we serve soberly, understanding everyone is not gifted the same way? Paul says, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. One writer says, you see, each church of Christ is like a body. Christ is the head and each member is like an organ, linked not only to the head, but also to all the other members. There are many different organs, each with a different function, and yet there is only one body. We have to understand, each organ functions differently, and yet each organ has the same purpose, the good of the whole body. And that's the way our body, physical body functions. 
you know, the, the liver and the heart aren't necessarily in direct connection, but in another sense, they kind of are because they have to work together and do their separate jobs for the whole of the body to be functioning in a good way. The same as the body of Christ. We have to come to a place to see that we'll have different gifts. All of those gift, gifts have varying degrees of maybe, uh, you know, functioning. And we might see them and say, well, that gift's more important than another. Well, maybe that's just a human perspective. So we say, well, preaching, that's preeminent. Well, uh, maybe not. There are people in the church who need to be served, and there are some people who are really gifted in serving. And if it's not for those people doing uh, their working out their giftedness in honor to Christ, then people might not be served and served in a very thoughtful and gracious way. This is what we need in the body of Christ. Different gifts, all a part of the one body, members one of another, functioning in their various roles, and the body will be healthy. Fourth question and last, do we serve soberly Understanding everyone does not have the same sphere of activity in service. Not everybody has the same sphere of activity in service. There will be some who teach, and there will be others who they may not teach, but they, they serve in a particular way. They help get meals to people that may be in need inside the local body of Christ. That's just as important as anything else. Because why? The whole body's functioning well together. If there's bad teaching and preaching that's not biblically based, it's not good, it's not solid, and there's serving going on, well, that's still not a healthy body. But if there's really, really good biblical preaching and teaching going on, and there's not serving going on, uh, there's not giving going on, uh, there's not exhortation going on, it, those, that church still going to be unhealthy. The body of Christ needs all of these things working together. And not everybody has the same sphere of activity. Um, one writer puts it in this way, he says, but that which here is implied, according to verses 3 through 6, in the measure of faith involves limitation to the sphere of activity. Now, this is the second portion of this because there can be a limitation of that. Um, some pastors preach to smaller congregations than others. Now, some of that's due to other issues. But sometimes, not everybody's a Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon had good, solid doctrine, and God allowed him to preach to thousands upon thousands. But there are other pastors who've been throughout history who have had good, solid doctrine, been very good preachers, and we know little of them. Some of them we don't know at all. There's a sphere of activity. There have been people that have served the church down through the ages, and we've never heard their names mentioned in church history. But it doesn't mean they weren't important. And God knew them, and God used them for His glory, and they are just as much a child of God, adopted into his family as a Charles Spurgeon. Well, this brings us to our second sub-point. Our first one was the mercy of God is so great in salvation that our minds and bodies are employed in spiritual humiliation. Well, the second sub-point is... The mercy of God is so great in salvation that our minds and bodies are employed in ecclesiastical humiliation. Ecclesiastical humiliation. Each local church represents the whole body of Christ, and each local church functions as one body. This is why God used the apostles to establish elders in each church. Now, think about it for a minute. Um, the whole body of Christ, in one sense, we would say Christ has his people uh, you know, all over the world. But really, how we know the body of Christ to function is in local bodies. 
You don't have elders for the whole state of Georgia. No, you have elders in local churches. That's where the body of Christ actually functions and works. And so there's ecclesiastical humiliation in this sense that each local body functions in humiliation one to another. We have to see that we are humbled in how we think of others. This is ecclesiastical humiliation inside the local body is we have to be humbled in how we think of others. We put the body of Christ before ourselves. I have to think of the body of Christ as being before me. Before me. Christ has saved me. I'm serving to or in Christ. And it's Christ who has saved me. Therefore, when I serve, I serve in humiliation in the sense that this is what Christ did. If Christ hadn't saved me, I wouldn't be, uh, in my case, preaching or teaching to anyone. The only reason my giftedness is used is because a local church has recognized it. I'm only a pastor or an elder because a local body has said, we call you out to do that because we think God has, has chosen to gift you in this way, and this is a, a gift we will allow you to use in this local body. I don't just call myself a, a, an elder or a pastor or a preacher and, and say, well, uh, somehow I, I, I know that this is who I am and I'll just get myself a following. No, it's a, a local body of believers that recognizes this kind of giftedness. Now, that begs some questions about church planting and church starts, and I'm not going to get into that right now. But you have to understand that there's a, a real genuine sense of that we put the body of Christ before ourselves. This is, this is ecclesiastical humiliation. How do we function in the church in humility? We put the body of Christ before ourselves. Um, and particularly Paul speaking of giftedness here, we could name other things, but, um, but particularly he's speaking of giftedness here. Now, before we move into to some of this next thought um, of, of dealing with this section of Scripture, I want to go ahead and and just quickly touch on this, the subject of the gift of prophecy. Because as we're talking about exercising these gifts, specifically one of the gifts that Paul brings up is prophecy. And I don't have time. My, my goal here is not to establish uh, some full-orbed thinking about the gift of prophecy. That's for another study. But I do want to touch on the subject quickly here because... Paul says, since we have gifts that differ according to grace given to us, verse 6, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. And then he begins to give examples. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching. Now, even though this is not my main theme uh, here to to argue for the ceasing of the gifts of prophecy and tongues, I will take a moment and make just a few comments. And there's kind of several aspects. Some have determined that prophecy, or that the prophecy Paul is speaking of in Romans, is linked to the office of prophet. There's an office of prophet, and that prophet will prophesy. Okay? And that being the case, um, people will say, well, Paul here is, is arguing uh, for this gift of prophecy and, 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 and in a sense, even the office of prophet. Um, some, in looking at that, have uh, given it this context that, you know, Paul here is calling for this office to be extended. This is kind of a, a charismatic view in some sense. There are others, like John Calvin, some of the Puritans, and, and one of the great Roman commentators, a man named Charles Haldane, 
he kind of uses Calvin's view as a, a summation of his own. And he's argued that uh, Paul is speaking of prophecy in a more extended sense of understanding existing scripture, that a man will understand existing scripture with the ability to thoughtfully explain it. And so they've had the view, um, you know, that this is simply really kind of preaching, teaching extension here when Paul talks about prophecy. Um, it's not necessarily the office of prophet in its purest form. This is in a New Testament sense. We have an extension from the idea of prophesy or prophecy here. And so it's talking about preaching and teaching one who can really kind of expound the Word of God. And then there are these others who have a charismatic view that the gift itself has been uh, extended in the New Testament church and we have prophets and we have prophecy. And if prophecy is still functioning in the church today, then we must accept those prophecies uh, on the basis of Scripture. Now, why would we say something like that? Well, um, if you hold a historical non-cessationist view or a modern charismatic view that these gifts have continued, I want to ask a question. And Sam Waldron has devoted a, a short book to this on, um, you know, have the gifts continued, and he does a good job of arguing this um, in the whole of his book. But in summation, um, this question is, what was the purpose of prophecy in establishing God's Word in both Testaments? What purpose did prophecy serve? Prophecy served the purpose of being revelatory. It's revelatory, or it's, it's revelation. Well, if it's revelation, then you're going to have to deal with prophecy, if it, especially if we're seeing it as divine revelation, we're going to have to deal with it in the context of, of Scripture. The, the Deuteronomic teaching on this would be that you, you put the prophet and the prophecy to the test. And if they fail the test, then what happens? The prophet is put to death. Now, I don't see many people in employing that line of thinking today. When someone comes out with prophecy and that prophecy is not fulfilled, nobody in the church puts them to death. Well, it gives us an indication that this office of prophet has, has ceased. Now, I wouldn't say to people there's a reason to go put them to death because we know that the office has ceased in another sense. Uh, you know, if you can't determine that there's, there's a failure in the prophecy, you know, let's say this new modern prophet comes about and starts prophesying, but you can't really determine that there's a failure in it per se, then we would possibly have to include the prophecy in New Revelation as a part of our canonical scripture. See, this begins to unfold really major issues, not just in the, the office of prophet, the gift of prophecy, but if you work at this from the wrong end, what you're going to do eventually is you're going to knock down the very canon of scripture. Ultimately, we would have to say, if you if you really hold to a non-cessationist view that the canon is not closed, we still have to take in new revelation and it becomes canonical because it's revelatory and you have to add it to Scripture. Well, here's a little question. I know I'll probably get some emails about this, but what if a verifiable copy of Paul's other original letter to the Corinthians was found. You know, there's people that may ask that question. Well, let's just for a little bit of, of a clue to solving that in a way, think of the distinction between verifiable copies of an established apostle's writing versus the prophecy 
of a post-apostolic modern individual. I think we would be able to work through that. We, we have to understand there's some real connection to our canon and, and, and what we have in the canon and the purpose of prophecy was revelatory. And we're, we're not looking for new revelation. We have all the revelation we need. Matter of fact, most prophets today would do well if they would just simply stick to the scripture. And furthermore, if you want to get into it eschatologically, uh, looking at the end times, we're not really looking for any you know, futuristic things to fall in place, per se. We're awaiting the very return of Christ. And he will return. He has not returned yet, but he is coming. He came, and he's coming again. Now, there's also another little view on this from church history, and it's the context of what, um, you know, we've talked about earlier, that it's just this extension it's this extension. And in that extension, some may want to argue that. I'm not going to argue against the extension today um, in, in that sense. I'm just going to say whatever Paul is speaking of here in prophecy, I don't think it's the office of prophet. Okay, um, I think that, that the gifts have ceased. But, but whatever Paul is speaking of here, his, his point is that we are, we are humbled in serving others. We're humbled in thinking of others, because we don't want to put others before ourselves. And Wasn't that part of the problem with the Corinthian church? Is they were looking at things like prophecy and tongues, and they were trying to put themselves above other people as what was more prominent. Paul's saying here, whatever this prophecy is, it's not to be looked at in that way. We are humbled in serving others. Prophecy is a gift of service. It's service to Christ, and ultimately that means to serve the body of Christ. It's not new revelation. It's service. That's what we're talking about here, is this whole theme of service and giftedness. So some are to prophesy, serve, teach, and exhort. And he's saying to them, then do so in proper proportion of faith. If you're going to teach the word of God, then teach it in faith to Christ. Don't teach it as to win accolades for yourself. It's difficult sometimes to do that. You want people to like you. You want people to think well of you. You want people to think well of what you do. But really, for the teacher, it's, have I served Christ well? For the one who serves others, have I served Christ well? Am I serving these others to get accolades for myself? Please notice what I'm doing. No, we serve unto Christ. This is the measure of faith which we serve into, unto, is the, to serve unto Christ. If you're going to exhort, don't just put flattery on people. In a sense, that's, you know, that's not what we're to do. We're not supposed to just be flattering people all the time. No, we exhort them. We exhort them in the cause of Christ. <clears throat> Some are to be givers. This is a gift they have. They have more to give, and they should give liberally. Certainly, give rightly to the church in tithes and offerings. But not only that, they need to give in the context of how they serve the body of Christ. Leaders must lead with diligence, not in laziness. Some have the gift of mercy, and they need to use it cheerfully. If you're a person who is merciful to others, be, be merciful to others uh, in, in a very cheerful way. 
Paul is saying this is what we're doing unto Christ. And we need to love each other. Now, this is going to move into the next section. So I'm going to stop there. But we understand what has been unfolded here is all about service and it's the body of Christ. And I'm going to leave you with three thoughts. Recognize God saved you to change you and continue to work in you. God's going to continue to work in his people. And these verses show us he's working in us as servants, those who will serve inside the local body. Secondly, recognize God's grace to you excludes boasting in self-righteousness. However we serve, whatever giftedness we have, we need to do it without boasting in ourselves. We need to do it understanding what our gifts are and what they are not. Some people want to be teachers when they're not teachers. Some people want to be givers when they don't, they're not givers. Thirdly, recognize God's plan includes believers working together in the church. Whatever your gift is, or your giftedness is, use it in the local body first and foremost. That's Paul's work here is to get us to see the importance of the local body of Christ. Now, Lord willing, next week uh, we'll look at continuing this study in Romans 12 to move towards a proper context of Romans 13.